By downloading or listening to this podcast, you are agreeing to Moody's legal terms and conditions found at moody's.com slash disclaimer, including that the information provided is not investment or financial advice, and that Moody's will not be liable for losses arising from your use of the information. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Moody's Talks, Focus on Finance. I'm Erin McDermott. Today, I'll be talking to Moody's analyst Felipe Carvalho in Mexico City about the outlook for banks in 2024. It's been a bumpy year, and not just for banks. They opened 2023 with the sudden failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank in the U.S., followed by that of Credit Suisse. That came on top of China's uneven recovery as it still struggles to emerge from the pandemic and to revive its property market. Now, as we close out the year, there are stark new worries about geopolitics, from Russia's ongoing war on Ukraine and now the hostilities between Israel and Hamas, creating even more uncertainty. Meanwhile, lingering inflation, concerns about commercial real estate, and continued high interest rates are slowing economic growth and giving rise to fears of recession and higher unemployment. But it's not all gloomy. Outside the U.S., ratings have generally gone up. Banks are far more profitable, and bank failures have been very low. So, to explain how banks are looking for this new year, we have Moody's analyst Felipe Carvalho here to help clarify the picture. Felipe has just published the Global Banks Outlook for 2024. Felipe, welcome to Focus on Finance. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Aaron. Good to be here. Uh, What a year, especially for my colleagues in the U.S., So your report says 2024 is looking like a difficult year for banks. There is a negative outlook globally. Can you give us an overview first in very broad terms from that global perspective? Sure. In general, the operating environment of banks in advanced countries will be affected by high interest rates, monetary policies, and the direction of inflation, as well as tighter lending conditions. For the U.S., we believe the economy will slow down as unemployment rises and consumer spending dampened by interest rates weighs on economic activity. We do expect a pickup in growth in the euro area and the U.K., but from a pretty low level. An important issue in Asia-Pacific, which is a very heterogeneous region, is that China's economic growth is set to slow due to lower consumption and investment. Overall, we expect real GDP growth among the G20 nations to remain below trend at 2.1% in 2024, down from an expected 2.8% in 2023. Because of this, we believe that the profitability boost banks enjoyed over the last two years will start to diminish as high rates translate into higher funding costs and lower portfolio growth, while asset quality will be squeezed by higher rates. In the US, net interest margins have already started to decline on rising funding costs that outpaced the rise in asset yields, which has led to lower profitability. At the same time, higher interest rates will push down revenue from segments such as mortgage banking and asset management. Net interest margins in Western Europe and Asia Pacific will expand a little longer with a more gradual pass through to funding costs. Liquidity and funding will be more of a challenge because of tighter monetary policies and their effect on deposits, which will generally continue to migrate to more costly term or leave the banking system entirely. But capital is likely to hold firm, supported by good earnings. We see ample capital cushions in Europe, which has the highest levels of capitalization on a risk-weighted basis. And in the US, we expect there to be capital build because of proposals for new regulations after the Silicon Valley bank failure. Let's break that down a bit. Banks in the US and Europe are facing a year that might not be as good as 2023, and they appear to have some challenges in common. In Europe, the drag from rate hikes in Euro area economies and the UK will continue to weigh on business and lending activity well into 2024, with Germany at the heart of the weakness in the Euro area. The European Central Bank is likely to begin rate cuts before the end of the first half and to end the year 
at 3.25%. We expect the euro area growth to pick up just a bit in 2024 to 1.1% after significantly deteriorating in 2023 and to remain still below trend. The Bank of England is likely to raise the bank rate one more time, given the persistence of services inflation. For the UK, we expect GDP growth to increase to 07 in 2024 from 0 0.5 in 2023. As such, we expect loan growth will continue to decline, reflecting tighter underwriting and needed loan demand. And in the US, we also envision the Fed's first rate cut, also toward the end of the first half, and the federal funds rate to end the year at around 4.25, 4.5, but for unemployment to rise, which will dampen consumer spending and loan demand while interest rates weigh further on economic activity. We're also concerned about risks from commercial real estate and new competition surging in from private credit. What about Asia-Pacific? In Asia-Pacific, China's economic slowdown is posing risks. China still faces weak domestic demand and lower exports as it continues to recover from the pandemic. We expect its real GDP to have grown by 5% in 2023 and to decelerate to 4% in 2024. A further slowdown will have major ramifications for the region. Growth in Asia-Pacific advanced economies will stabilize at low levels after slowing in 2023 on weak global trade and higher rates. For China's banks, asset risks will increase from the country's economic slowdown as well as a prolonged stress among property developers and local government financing vehicles, with weaker profitability as net interest margins will contract further on loan repricing from the central bank's policy easy, and the flow of funds to more expensive time deposits. Real estate and all of its related sectors such as construction will continue to be a key risk also for banks in Hong Kong, SAR, China, as well as in Korea and Vietnam, with the risk for Hong Kong banks largely stemming from their commercial property loans in mainland China. So up front, you caveated that negative outlook by emphasizing advanced economies. In your report, there are some bright or at least less dark pockets of resilient GDP growth, mainly in emerging markets that will better sustain bank operations. Yes, banks in several emerging markets will benefit from an earlier easing of monetary policies and higher or at least resilient GDP growth. We are already seeing major rate cuts among emerging markets, including Brazil, Chile, Hungary, and Peru, which will also boost economic recovery and prop demand for loans. Other emerging market central banks have already stabilized monetary policy since 2022, such as those of India and South Africa. Banks in countries that don't rely heavily on international trade will also benefit from more favorable operating environments. In India, for example, we will have GDP growth of 6.1% in 2024, and Indonesia will expand at 5%. Brazil's economy benefited from agriculture and mining in 2023, and we see upward potential for 2024. In the Gulf, banking systems are benefiting from high oil prices, but also from robust non-hydrocarbon expansion that stems from government efforts to diversify their economies. Countries in the Commonwealth of, of Independent States, like Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, are also seeing gains from oil prices, higher trade volumes, and their new trade roles now that Russia has fewer commercial ties with Western countries. And the other big factor in emerging markets is the geopolitical tensions between China and the US and the EU, which is reshaping industrial policies and driving multinationals to diversify their supply chains. This is the nearshoring effect? Yes, countries are reallocating manufacturing operations of multinational companies closer to consumer markets to diversify away from supply chain disruption and geopolitical risks. Taking Mexico as an example, this has resulted in several upward adjustments to GDP growth during 2023, and we expect more upward adjustments to the 2.3% expected GDP growth for 2024. And it is not just Mexico. These Geopolitical shifts are also benefiting countries across Southeast Asia and Central America, including India. Getting back to your report, funding and liquidity are going to remain a challenge for banks in 2024. It's because of the effects of monetary tightening as well as a shift in deposit flows. 
customers are just moving to accounts that are more expensive for banks, like CDs and other time deposits that generate more interest. More recently, there's been attention to deposits leaving the banking system entirely. How do you expect banks to fare on this front? Looking back for context, at the peak of the pandemic, there were several direct support measures for individuals and small businesses. Along with central bank moves that triggered high deposit inflows in most banking systems. There was a surge in cheap side or demand deposits. But you're right that this benefit has waned as pandemic support measures lapse and interest rates rise. In this new environment, we expect banks with more diversified and deeper franchises to fare better than those with more concentrated, less granular, or more wholesale funding mixes. Mostly, that pattern will continue into 2024. In many banking systems, big volumes of stable deposits and strong capital market demand are key strengths that support funding and liquidity. While deposit concentration is generally high among Gulf Cooperation Council banking systems, we expect their already ample liquidity buffers to remain high and temper risks. Holdings of liquid assets have been falling across most regions since 2021, but remain ample, considerably higher than 30% of tangible banking assets, with high liquidity coverage ratios that are well above 100% as of the first half of 2023. Basel standards implemented in Europe and most parts of Asia Pacific and among large universal global banks will ensure ample liquidity. We expect banks in Western Europe to maintain ample liquidity, even if it eventually converges with pre-COVID levels as targeted long-term refinancing operations run off. In your report, you write that bank funding is now on a new playing field in the U.S. and to some extent Europe when taking the rapid growth of private credit into account. Can you talk about how the competitive landscape is shifting? So, private credit has emerged as a highly attractive source of financing for smaller and mid-sized companies. The private credit market has taken off and we expect it to grow further. According to a study by Prequin, Private credit is projected to hit $2.3 trillion in assets under management by 2027. These markets are most developed in the U.S., but are also beginning to sh take share in the European leveraged loan market. In 2024, we believe large banks in the publicly syndicated loan market, which has lost significant leveraged loan share to private credit rivals in, the, in recent years, will be competing aggressively as new leveraged buyouts, known as LBOs, emerge. These lenders are sitting on a considerable arsenal of dry powder, capital that must be put to work. This will likely raise pressure on loan pricing and terms, eroding credit quality and fueling systemic risks. Same time, risk-averse investors are pushing many weaker borrowers into private credit which caters to smaller, more highly leveraged companies and also functions outside the purview of prudential regulators. And we also now have investment and commercial banks beginning to jump into the private credit space as well, pointing to new areas of risk. It's certainly setting things up for an interesting new year. What could change this negative outlook? What are the areas to watch? Here's what the conditions for a stable outlook might look like here a sharper fall in inflation, and a pickup in economic growth. Funding and liquidity concerns recede with a return to deposit growth, which would produce a Goldilocks scenario where the risk of asset quality deterioration recedes and business activity picks up, enabling balance sheet growth to counteract slight declines in interest margins with limited increases in provisioning for loan losses. Thank you, Felipe. Um, well, we need to wrap up there. So many thanks to you for your perspective on bank credit heading into 2024. And thanks to all of our listeners tuning in. Please join us again soon for the next episode of Focus on Finance. Thanks for listening to this Moody's Talks podcast. To find out more about the topics discussed, 
please follow the links in the show notes. You can check out other Moody's Talks podcasts by visiting moody's.com slash podcasts.